Hello everybody, this is me, your host Akriti Anand once again and after that enlightening session on China 2050, China's path to leadership with Dr. Robert Elkun and Sanjay Pugalia. Now we are moving forward to the next session, which is dedicated on everything around innovation engineering. What is innovation engineering? Innovation engineering is an area which focuses on creating anything new, whether in a large firm, research lab, new venture, or an innovative student project. The reality is that every talented team with logical plans often fail. Innovation engineering provides the framework, process, leadership style, and behaviors necessary for successful innovation. Uh, delivering this keynote, we have a very special guest. We have Dr. Iklak Sindhu. Dr. Iklak Sindhu is founding director and chief scientist of Saturdija Center for Entrepreneurship and Technology at UC Berkeley, USA. And uh, to conduct the Q&A session, we will have Mr. Nirmal Panikar. So over to you. Welcome. Uh, okay, thank you. Um, I'm going to first share my screen in order to get started. And I'll just ask you to double check that um, you can see it. First, I have to put it into presentation mode. We can see your screen, sir. OK, that's, uh, you can see it, and I cannot yet, but it's, it's coming soon. All right, so if I'm not mistaken, you can see the slides. and. Uh, uh, basically slides full screen, correct? Yes, we can. Okay, all right, welcome everyone and thank you. It's my pleasure to get a chance to talk to you about innovation engineering and to frankly be speaking at Thai Global Summit this year, 2020. Uh, um, as introduced, I'm Iklak Sidhu. Uh, I'm the founding director and chief scientist at the Satarja Center at UC Berkeley. All right, so, um, First of all, before I explain more about innovation engineering, let me just start with this idea. Why is it so difficult to teach people how to innovate? And that means you know, starting new ventures or creating technology innovation, or really just making anything that's useful in the world um, for teaching people to do that. And I mean, students, companies, employees and companies, researchers, executives, just in general, you know, what is complicated about it? And um, I, I'll say, you know, before we go into how we're doing it, uh, that there is a bis, bit of a, you know, misconception that you can teach it like other subjects, and it's simply not true. You can't teach it the way that you can teach like math or physics or, or other things where you prescribe or you show someone like the formula and that they repeat it or the case study and they follow it. And as you can imagine, uh, because someone can read a book and tell you what's in it does not mean that they can start a company. It doesn't mean that they can create an innovation. There's something more that has to be understood or learned. So let me now explain uh, what we learned uh, at Berkeley when we were trying to uh, work on this. We're trying to develop people who are innovators. Um, in 2005, this is about 15 years ago, I started what is the Satarja Center for Entrepreneurship and Technology. And the way that we started was that we basically used to use case study. So like Harvard case study or you know, the basic frameworks of entrepreneurship and innovation. And we would teach them to engineers, scientists, and actually people all over the campus. Um, after some time, what we did was we used to invite people who were in those cases into our classrooms. So if it was a TiVo case, we might invite the executive vice president of marketing from TiVo or whatever type of case it was, we could quite often get the CEO or someone who was actually in the case to speak um, in the classroom. And what we found was that the speakers were actually more interesting than the case themselves. That's not really a surprise. Um, but the thing is that the speakers had more than the logic of the case. They had um, a mindset. They have a behavior pattern. They had been on that path. And what we started to do was start to teach people or actually develop people 
to have those behaviors, the same behaviors that these entrepreneurs had, instead of teaching the logic of the case, could we teach the behavior that these people had? Could we teach the way they see the world? Because that was so important to being able to innovate. A few years later, uh, we started to take these techniques. Oh, and by the way, that's called Berkeley Method of Entrepreneurship. And then a few years later, what we did was we built um, one of our very deep technical classes. It's called um, Data X. It's uh, a bit of a hacker's guide to data science. It's very, it's quite technical, but we mixed the behaviors and the, the mindset and the process of innovation, Berkeley Method, with this deep technical domain. And we, we ran this course and it's a very successful course. And, and frankly, um, uh, uh, this is maybe the first course where these two ideas really got mixed together, the behavioral innovation part and the part about the, the technical, the deep technical part. And what we learned from that, I ended up writing in a book called Innovation Engineering. And this became a framework that we're using in many places at Berkeley today. So we use it, of course, in Data X, in our engineering leadership program, in our 5G AI lab. Uh, we use it in new programs like Global Venture Catalyst, our blockchain labs. Um, and actually, all the tools and content and everything that we use here is open, it's free. It's actually available for other people to use also. So um, I'm gonna give you some um, examples and help you understand uh, what this is and how it's different in, in a way. Okay, so um, here's some examples. Uh, I mentioned Data X already. Like I said, it's a very applied data science type of course. Uh, students in 12 weeks do learn to um, build projects that detect fake news or predict stock market prices or um, figure out where, um, where to walk to avoid crime or just all these types of projects. Um, we do this you know, quite regularly. Okay, um, and um, now let me explain to you how this class works because the ideas of innovation engineering are built in. You know, some of the ideas of entrepreneurship, like developing story and, um, and the kind of iterative agile approaches, they're all built into this course. So what we do in this class is for the first five or six weeks, before people really just jump into building something, we make them develop what's called an insightful story. And that story, gets translated into something else called a low-tech demo, which is basically the project, but in slide form. And then there's eight more weeks of agile sprint, and then the, um, the output, the project is demonstrated. This whole process happens in um, 12 weeks, 12, 13 weeks. Okay, so these components, you can see how they're being mixed together, the behavioral and the process. And by now, Data X has become a platform. Um, companies all over the world come. They um, mix with students who uh, bring their skills. Companies bring their problems, their data. And we're, we have about 150 students uh, every semester that are doing these types of projects at Berkeley. Uh, now, let me give you another example. This is my second example. Um, in this one, uh, this is a course on innovating 5G uh, with AI. So we had all the main telecom companies, AT&T, Sprint, which is now T-Mobile, Vodafone, so forth, all participating. Uh, they had their executives provide a starting point for the problems. And uh, we used the same model uh, of mixing people together and the behaviors and so forth. And if you um, look at like how we started in, in this topic, we said, you can reinvent the telephone company as you know it, any telecom function with AI, what will that mean? Or reinvent any of the customers, you know, any of the verticals. Now that 5G, IoT, any of these things are happening, how will those customers work differently than before? If you look at the model, it's a very similar model to Data X, the same thing, insightful story, low tech demo, solution in the end, 
We're doing in-situation guidance and, um, and developing the innovation culture while we do it, okay? Um, examples of things that have come out of this course include, you know, so we did these projects among others, um, a new version of 911, like emergency services, all based on IoT, um, a drone that follows power lines to know if they might start a forest fire if they're too close to trees, um, virtual reality art museums, smart bins for uh, smart cities to know what kind of garbage you're putting in, everything that you can imagine um, relating to how 5G is intersecting you know, these applications. Okay, I'm gonna give you a third example. And um, this is one of our like most recent initiatives. Um, this is a global venture catalyst. So the problem that I'm solving here with, with this project, this initiative is that university education is quite strong in teaching theory and logical skills, but there's a gap. And the gap is that even if you study you know, any subject, you know, at, even at top universities, um, understanding, like you could study supply chain, but do you know the actual domain knowledge of supply chain? Um, do you know what people who work in supply chain actually talk about every day? Uh, you won't, and you won't have industry connections and you won't have those behaviors for success. So what we're doing with Global Venture Catalyst is that we are inviting students from all over the world and really top universities, Stanford, Berkeley, um, you know, this whole list, uh, everyone, Harvard, Wharton, um, uh, we're inviting them and we're getting like incredibly great demand actually here. And you can see the kind of skills that they're bringing um, and we're gonna have them work on design sprints with companies and with mentors over four days. And this is something that people can do every three months, maybe you know, repetitively. They build their resumes and they build lifelong connections with other students and with mentors. So it's a way for students to get that extra layer of practical understanding and connection into the world that they don't get otherwise. Um, one more example, engineering leadership uh, program at Berkeley. This is an executive program. And um, you know, we have people from Apple, Google, Yahoo, Network Appliances, Samsung, Cisco, so forth. Um, and now it's really becoming more globally available because of the way that we offer it. Um, and again, innovation, uh, engineering ideas are built into this executive program as well. Okay, so um, this is the pattern. This, you know, if you look at all the examples that I showed you up till now, the pattern is that um, you take a technical area, um, it could be data, blockchain, 5G, um, also challenge areas like deplastifying the planet, plant-based meat, future of retail, future of healthcare. You take any of those topics, and you intersect it with the entrepreneurial mindset, the behavior, the process, the journey, uh, and you put those things together and you really have these innovation engineering programs. Um, when you don't put this entrepreneurial component with it, then these courses are just academic, they're plain, they're passive. Um, you know, a data class is just a class on data, but when you mix it, then you, with these entrepreneurial topics uh, and follow these processes that we're building, then you have a completely different output than you have uh, you know, without it. And this applies not only at Berkeley and you know, um, at the student level, but it applies in companies, it applies just globally and in incubators, it, it applies to startups and so forth. So all of the tools that we're using um, for innovation engineering, they are public, they're open, they're free. So anyone that wants to or needs to innovate, so instructors that want to teach in this way can um, get to these materials, venture teams that want to build new products, uh, companies that want to innovate, students that want to practice their very applied nature, accelerators who want programming for their venture teams, all, you know, it doesn't really matter who you are. You can get syllabi, project models, video content, code samples, um, different kinds of canvases, um, all the things that we've been developing, they're, they're there. 
they're at this site, innovation-engineering.net. There's a picture of the site here. I'm gonna give you some examples here again. So DataX, as I mentioned, all of our code samples, uh, the way that the course works, the sample syllabi, videos that explain the topics, they're all you know, available. And in fact, when we teach it, we're teaching it in what's called flip model. So we assign it, people watch it, they do their homework. When they meet in class, we don't lecture to them. We instead discuss the homework or we discuss the project. It's interactive, even though it's on this um, semi-asynchronous model. Okay, so again, same websites. And actually this one is datax.berkeley.edu. You can get to all of them from Innovation Engineering. Okay, um, on, the, um, uh, on the entrepreneurship topics, uh, we have something called Open CET, and uh, from Innovation Engineering or from the Sitarjo Center website, you can also um, find all of our entrepreneurial materials, including the video that goes with the lecture. In fact, the entire class is available and people can even teach their own version of the class without us. Um, or of course, people can collaborate with us and, and teach it as well. Okay, um, another thing that goes in the entrepreneurial space, let me just say this, is that um, you know, there's four parts to any venture project. Team, that, you know, who's the people, the story, that you validate it and that you can execute it. Usually when this happens in a classroom environment, Team and story become the main part of a class, validation less, and execution small. In real life, it's the opposite. Team and story are just a starting point. You have to do a better job of validation, and really all the value comes from the execution. So um, as we've been coaching actual ventures, as we've been coaching um, venture teams at different stages, uh, lots of times teams don't have a good balance. They're not sure um, how to know that they've done enough on the team or they've done enough on the validation or what's even involved in the execution. So recently we built a meta canvas that people can check off. Did they really get past the starting point? Have they done enough on the validation? Have they done enough on the execution? Do they know what's really involved before you scale? So it's kind of taking you through these stages. Okay. So um, that's another tool, again, available that um, anyone can use. And um, one uh, final example that I'll give in this category is um, we have a model called Innovation Collider. And it's different than um, really all the other kind of static laboratories that people um, use normally in academics and in research institutions. Uh, your normal lab is focused on publishing papers and has you know, experts that really focus on, um, on you know, deep science and or the publication. What we're doing is we are really mixing people. So the, the basis of the lab is the mixture of people. So undergraduates, graduates, global partners, people from everywhere, they come in, we teach them a certain mindset, and then under some pressure, we have them work on these types of projects, the kind that I was uh, showing earlier in the presentation. And through the mixing of people who are different from each other, that's when you get concepts exchange, new technologies, new ventures, all of those types of outputs. So for any company or any other university that wants to look at different types of lab models, uh, we also explain um, this model of how we do the innovation collider type of laboratory. We use it in all of our X labs, data, blockchain, plant-based meat, so forth. We use it in all of them. Okay, so um, here's a bit of a summary of the ideas in innovation engineering. Um, it's really about, you're gonna start somewhere, every project, company, whatever it is, start somewhere. You've got a goal to get somewhere else, launch your project, launch your product, whatever it is. And along the way, there's some sort of journey. There's inductive learning, which if we had more time, we could explain um, the difference in, in the thinking process. There's the technical tools and the theory. There's the idea of story first. You always have to develop a story before you start building. 
requirements are not enough, that people have to get aligned around a story. And then incremental execution, how you do that, and the behaviors and mindsets that entrepreneurs and innovators have. If you put all those things together, then you have the framework for innovation engineering. Uh, those ideas, those concepts are you know, articulated in the book and all the tools are available um, on the website. So um, that's a quick um, understanding or communication explanation of innovation engineering. Um, and at this point, I'm happy to um, answer questions or discuss anything that wasn't clear in the presentation so far. Okay, that's it. I can leave it on any of these slides. Let me take it out of slide. Actually, yeah, let me take it out of this mode. Um, okay. Um, okay, so um, I, I left some time at the end here for questions and answers. Uh, for people who are watching, you can type in chat questions. Um, I'm, I really prefer to have dialogue with people. Um, we can, of course, talk more about you know, any of these topics. We can spend the last three or four minutes if we need to with more information. But if anyone there has questions or wants to discuss something, this is a really good time to, um, uh, to let us know. Uh, audience, if you have questions, uh, kindly uh, type and post it on the Slido option. If you want, I can ask you a question as the audience uh, of the things that were presented. Um, which you know, which do you you know, which do you remember or are like most memorable to you? Uh, uh, I'm, I would love to hear and be able to. Um, you know, have you reflect on it or, or reflect on it myself? Uh, Dr. Sidhu, just uh, one question. How, how would innovation in design come in here, this concept? Uh, okay. Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, so uh, um, so the, the question is, um, what about the topics of innovation and also design? So on the, on the topic of, so innovation broadly, you know, to me, that's basically creating or transforming, you know, anything that's new. Um, in, in general, there's kind of two versions of that. You know, there is um, the things that are applied, you know, very, and usually um, um, there's, and sometimes there's a version where money has to be made. It's not enough to make something new, but revenue has to come back. So for a venture, innovation isn't just innovation. It, it isn't just making something that's applied. It's also making money while, while you do it. Um, and this process works in, you know, in both of those cases. There's no doubt about that. The one difference with the design topic is that design is usually about improving a product. But when you talk about a venture, when you talk about building something that earns revenue, you have to also design the business model. You have to design more than the, than the product itself. You have to design the message that goes with the product 
You have to design the message that works with the channel. You've got to test it in a lot of different ways that um, just the product by itself doesn't need to be tested. So um, design is an aspect, uh, but innovation is broader. Uh, just another question. Uh, do we have a short term or long term scale in innovation engineering? Uh, a short or long term scale in which? I, I mean, in just innovation. To ask the question in that, uh, or just help me clear, understand the question better. Uh, I, I think I didn't fully understand the question. So uh, the question is, do we have a short term or long term scale? I'm, I'm guessing uh, in terms of duration in innovation engineering. Oh, oh, yeah. So like, how long does it take to, to yeah. use these yes. ideas? You know, in universities, we tend to use semester boundaries or quarter boundaries, and we can do most projects that way. In companies, a lot of projects happen over quarterly intervals. So people test things on the quarter of about 100 days. That's very common also. But you can use these things in design sprints that happen just over a week. And you can use these ideas over longer periods of time as well. Thank you, Dr. Sido. Uh, uh, I think uh, that's, uh, that's it. Uh, no more questions as such. I thank you for your time. I know it's late evening in California. Thank you for taking time and uh, you know, talking to the participants on this very innovative, uh, very interesting topic as such. Uh, thanks. Okay, uh, nice having you at TGS. Yeah, no, I really appreciate it. Thank you. I'm glad.